Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me on another of my interview series. Today, I'm going to be talking to a gentleman who's written a fascinating book called Smoke and Mirrors. Everything that you were told about the monarchy and the law is a lie, or words to that effect. His name is um, Edward Fitzgerald. Sorry, Edward, I'd nearly lost your name. Hello, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Richard. This is a real pleasure. Oh, it's it's and my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Let me, I just want to put the title of your book up. I've got to find it. We've got here a whole load of bits and pieces. Here we go. Um, just so people can see it. Let's make that. There we are. Edward Fitzgerald, Smoke and Mirrors. Is everything they told you about the monarchy and the law a lie? And that's a very interesting question that uh, a lot of people will be fascinated about at the moment because, of course, we've got the coronation coming up. We have the new king. Um, and there's a lot of questions to be asked. Is he going to uh, be the right sort of person for us and have our best interests at heart? And what about the law itself? Is that working for us? And I know in my channel I've been talking a lot about that. Um, and indeed, William Keat, of course, has been talking about um, the Constitution and things like that. So um, it's fascinating to talk to you. You've spent a lot of time uh, at Q uh, Archives... That's uncovering right. all sorts of information so so maybe just tell us how how the book came about and then and then we'll delve into it yeah okay so just to preface um i've been called many things over my lifetime um and when i produce this book i've been referred to as a legal scholar or a lawyer or whatever i'm none of those things um i, I yes i have written other books um and when i started to write i actually i didn't start off writing this one I was writing a different book um, and I was asked, um, I was, I had a, uh, a problem that was, was put, put to me, you know, um, there were uh, laws, then there was a new draft law that was being, many draft laws are being, being um, pushed at the moment over the last 12, 12 to 24 months. And one of them was the schools bill, which was essentially um, removing the rights of uh, mothers and fathers and guardians to on how on what their choice of schooling was um, right. so if you were homeschooling then you know you'd effectively be forced down the route of having to have all the same um same sort of curriculum. administrative stuff on placed upon you oh, right. um, that uh, as that, you know and being under the oversight of a of the local authority even if you had one child that had um what they call an ehcp so if you've got a child that doesn't fit in and they, they need to put ex extra care around, um, they, then that one child, you would then have to register under the, the same um, mechanisms and have the same oversight. And it was under the, under um, Boris's, you know, no child left behind. Well, you know, that was the, That's that, the, was the sound, that was the sound bite. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah. so what, what it did, what I did was I, I was investigating different ways, you know, how can we remedy this mm. for all those those voices those parents you know of which i'm one um that you know this what just didn't seem right you know for dawn of time we've as parents we've had choice over how we educate our children whether there's you know tutelage homeschooling mentoring you know um uh apprenticeships for instance and um so i i, I stumbled across something called a petition of right um which goes back into um, our constitution, Magna Carta 1215, but it was, it's was it been restated. Lots of things that, and even Magna Carta is a re, you know, it wasn't called Magna Carta, then it wasn't called Magna Carta until 1217. Uh, it was called, just called the Great Charter, uh, sorry, the Charter of Runnymede, and there's then had other um, terms applied to it. So like it's been known, known as, also known as yes. um, the Great Charter and, and in there, it just gives you the the provision to petition the king or, um, or the queen, the monarch, without fear of any retribution or any uh, prosecutions brought against you. So there was just like a, a, the original version of how we do the petitions to the parliament now. So where you raise, you know, you've got an online service where you can make up an email address and fill it in three times if you are so 
so versed to do right, so. Right. Um, and you might get five minutes at the end of a session with 100,000 100, people. So these are the petitions that people go online to do that they yeah. can do. And and, that, and, uh, and I often wonder, do they work? I mean, do they, you, you know, because they, they manage to get the, what, the 100,000 uh, names that you want. Yeah. And then, the, and as you say, they get a little bit of time to discuss it. And then, you know, you, you never quite know if it's going to happen or not. That's right. Um, and so this mechanism really, is, so what I've covered in the book and, the, and how the book came about was because I'd written this petition of right for parents initially to, to be yeah. able to yeah. submit, giving all the, the historical precedents for, um, for our cu ancient customs and rights around educating our children. That's how it really started. But then I realized it had much, much wider application. And so the context of it changed. But then I realized I needed to provide all the evidence, you know, and I think somewhere I wrote in the book, you know, in the, in the world of, of smoke and mirrors, transparency is paramount because, and that's what I've done with the book. I include uh, access to all the research material that I've gathered. Uh, I've painstakingly uploaded it to the Internet Archive and other places so that, you know, the readers can access that original documentation. So tell me, the title is obviously intriguing, Smoke and Mirrors. And so what are you referring to? Because I suppose there'll be a lot of people who will be thinking like I was when I started to question things. You know, everything doesn't quite seem to fit in. The dots seem to be a bit separated and you're trying to join the dots yourself. You don't always know if you've got the right lines going to the right places. So yeah, smoke and mirrors does seem somewhat intriguing. So and, that, and and then you've and then you've uh, you've really enticed us by saying, is it all potentially a lie? Yeah. So it really had a very dry title to start with, which was a compendium for your uh, undoubted and inalienable rights, and that doesn't really trip off the tongue. And it, the smoke and mirrors was, you know, I've made some documentaries in the past, and I thought, well, if I were to if it was a, a fictional book or a, a, a documentary or something, you know, or a film, I might call it Smoke and Mirrors. Yeah. So yeah. it was only in towards the end of the process that that I thought, well, uh, you know, this probably does sum it up in most people's minds. So you're bringing um, you're bringing stuff into question. So what 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 are you actually saying then? Uh, you, you know, what are, what are you suggesting that is um, questionable about the, the law and and the monarchy? Um. Well, I, you know, the, the simple question is, you know, either, and I think um, your previous guests may have asked the question as well, either the government or we, the people, hold the power in that relationship. It can't be, it can't be, it can't be, be both. Be. And, and, you know, and what I provided in, in the book is the evidence to say that it is us. It right. is the people. I've covered, and that's uh, very reassuring. I think for 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 everybody because we do mm. feel as if we're now living in some sort of tyranny. Well, this is the you know this is the point of why the Constitution was written back in 1215 was because we had a monarch that had gone rogue. He'd become tyrannical. He'd broken his broken the law. He'd broken his coronation oath. Was applying taxes left, right, and centre, sending his sheriffs out, and they were unruly and had and so you know the barons, which in the ancient term, and I, I cover these in the book as well. Mm. So there's a lot of words that are old english they their meaning has changed through time and the use of language has been the primary tool for deception since right. then yeah so um i've tried to 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 go back and find the origins of the words what, what they would have meant at the time without getting too sort of scholarly about it but just to show to people for instance the term liberty I'm a sailor. My background's yacht racing and things like that. I know from a nautical perspective, liberty doesn't, you know, means also means in in, in um, naval vernacular, that's you're given liberty to go ashore. Right. Um, so, so it's like a, like p permission. Permission, yeah. So there's play on words. So I know that um, Will has had mentioned previously on your show about trial by jury being, you know. Um, a cornerstone foundation uh, upon which we we hold um, the, the mechanisms of the you know of, uh, of creating laws, laws, creating or, or, laws yeah. and everything else um, to to account um, that 
word, those words in themselves have been transversed. We now have jury trials, not trial by jury. So it literally, you know, it's a literally a literal reversing of. of yeah, no, that's language. interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I'm amazed at, at when I start to look at things and I go, oh, my God, it's so obvious. Yeah, you know, it's it all, is so again, obvious. That thing about being in plain sight, but we just yeah. we just kind of don't see it, do we? Well, it's not surprising. We are, um, you know, it's not just our generation or our parents or our grandparents. This, this is multi generational. You know, I would, I, I dip into the to it a little bit in the chronology of the book because I, um, in in order to to prove sort of the fact that our ancient customs are not um, just a figment of our ima imagination or folklore. Mm. That, that there's something tangible there. So I mean, I go back to um, fossil records, you know, from 700,000 years ago, you know, earliest point that, that we had, you know, indigenous people on this, this archipelago that we call the British Isles, um, that it's infeasible, you know, in, um, inexcusable to, to give the narrative credibility that we've only really had, you know, it's only been the last three, 4,000 years that we've really evolved. Yeah. Oh, you've, 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 I've lost your audio. Have you flipped? Uh, just, we just got technical hitch, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just show you the, uh, the screen again, if I can find my mouse. Here we go. Smoke and mirrors. Oh, my helps back. If I are you you are back there we go i it do apologize you. no no don't worry don't worry the these power, things happen the power, the power went out on my um my wireless mic yeah so, so um you go back to uh, fossil records you were saying well well essentially i mean just to prove the point that, that we that man that has been are, around yeah yeah that we've been around for a long time um and um so you know whilst i've done done that that's really just to prove the point that you know, um, you know our oral traditions. You know, our, our traditions weren't written down. You know, laws weren't written down. Uh, you know, we, we've, as a society, there's been that um, it, right the way through back to antiquity. Is is a, a tradition of oral recantation of the law and um, societal values, and they're passed from 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 from, you know, mouth to ear from generation to generation. And um, so, in in, te in the in the context of people challenge, you know, I have been challenged along the way by people. Well, oh, show me where that's written down. And it's like, well, not everything is written down. And and just because it's like the the thing around um, trial by jury, when I you know I've used the the term a, a convener, for mm. want of a better term. Oh, it doesn't say anywhere that there's a convener. Um, the the issue with that is the fact that they wouldn't have written that there was a judge or there wasn't a judge if if the if the jurors were the judges in in the outset exactly yeah <laughs> this is that's the thing the juries are doing the judging yeah. and, and someone um, someone had to convene the the meeting to get people together yeah and um so it's essentially going from you know on a simp on a on a sort of a helicopter view mm. um i the the book explains the hierarchy of natural law, living men and women. Uh, um, and from that, we have our first, first of all week was, which is our, our monarch, we, we appoint the monarch. And then under the monarch's royal prerogative, they, um, the day-to-day the, the -day dealings of uh, managing the kingdom become too complex. So in 1264, 1265, the king appointed um, you know, parliament representatives, and then then you have par both houses of parliament, commons and lords, and then he appoints um, ministers, and then you've got your judiciary that sits to one side, um, and then, but the, the concept really is is completely inver inversed. You know, where we're put at the bottom of the of this, the base of of of, of this, we're in, in the hierarchical structure. You've got natural laws. So the, the one that I explained. So, so Richard, if um, you were to live on an island all mm. on your own with your, with your, with your beautiful girlfriend, 
Oh, well, that's um, kind of, you, I, for a moment there, I thought I was going to be lost all just on my no, own. But if the lovely no, no. Julia is with me, it would be marvellous. Yeah. <laughs> Quite happy. Um, you, you wouldn't really have to have any, any, thing, any laws, any rules... No. Apart from apart from the the ones that the the universe that are universal that apply yeah, throughout yeah. the whole of the, of the planet, um, you know the sun rises and sets and um, seasons come and go and you know you're you're free to to, to um, sustain life, to grow vegetables, to to erect shelter, to have access to water and I'm liking it resources. already. I'm loving it. It's only really when you then then when you you're in a construct of you know, um, adding more people, adding more people that you then have to put some rules in there for being a good neighbor and what have you. And that's essentially how these ancient laws and customs came about. And they would have been different in different parts of the country. Yeah. Um, and it's not until the, you know, so a lot of those, so I said about the fact that they would be um, oral by tradition. If we go even go back, no, not that far, but back to Saxon times. And they started to organise um, the land and, and the villages and all this stuff. And they would create what they called hundreds. Right. And that was right. essentially 10 tithings or 10 families. And, you know, they, those families might be multi generational. So you could have 10 or more per family. Um, and then they would elect an elder or a chief. And then from that, they would have gatherings. Um, you know, in, in a, they would call them different things depending on where they convened their assemblies. Their so they might go to a moot, moot mound or things like that. Absolutely, that's that's right. So they were called, you know, um, folk moots or um, shire moots, and they would they would be called different things depending on where they met, what the construct of it was, and they would then form what, for want of a better term, is courts. Right. They never called them courts. No. You know, they, they were. Um, and but the, the individuals would have different names based on um, based upon their role, and and that's the thing. So out throughout the ages, they've been called different things in different places, and developed. Uh, so, and developed. I guess so, developed so, so they were never called jurors. Over time. Yeah. yeah, they wouldn't yeah. call juries. They wouldn't have been called a juror. Juror was a much more modern term derived from jurata as a um, from the Latin. Right. A, a, back back in sort of late Saxon period, it would have been, they would have been called hundred doors or suit, suit and then later on suitors. So a bit like the lawsuit, but right. they were, but they were mixed up. So yeah. if, if you were the person coming in at, with a claim against them for having bro- breached some rule, you'd be called a suitor and the jury would be called suitors and they would be the judges and the, and the chief. So going back to the hundred mm. sort of constructs, the chief would, would take on a, you know, um, a different, it'd be called a hundredsman or a, an eldor or something like that. And um, you can still find these sort of etched in, on the walls in um, the old courts in, in Oxford. And they, they've got the names of the hundred, the hundred or um, in there. And, um, but over time, so there was also um, a period called, um, there was a king called In, I-N-E, um, and his dooms, uh, which were his law law codes, as it were, were um, so it was called the Dooms of Inn. But the people that served as jurors were called doomsmen. And I don't mm. know whether the whether the you know when when Richard, you've been told, ah, oh, you're doomed. Whether that that originated oh, right. from the fact you've been judged. The Dooms of Inn. I like that. Yeah, yeah you're so doomed. The, the thing is, we, we've the the words and things, the language that's been used throughout different periods have have, have changed. Yes. So yes. went to, and it's been quite easy for that for those bits to be airbrushed out of history. I know. I mean, I never studied history at school or. So would you say that. that a lot of that's now manipulated on purpose to to confuse us in this in this day and age? I think it's possibly very. Um, I might be over generous in in saying that it's convenient. Right. Okay. Very convenient. Yeah. Very convenient. Uh, yeah. To to the point that as as you said you're know, not quite sure whether you connected the right dots or not mm. and that's all i've been doing is connecting the dots um, but i have come across manuscripts and documents that paint the narrative that is being pushed and and the 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 view which is the orthodox view that's being pushed now as to you know our constitution is not one document it's multiple yes. 
Um, and, but they, these are all the acts of parliament they passed. Um, we, you know, so it's, um, I've had to sort of not be selective, but I've had to go, okay, on that piece of evidence, i.e. That, pe that text that's been written there, do I throw out the entire book or just the preface because the preface was written by somebody else and they've sullied the, the rest of the material to sort of give it a different context. Oh, see. Um, and um, so, it's, I've, so I'm, I'm quite open to the fact that I'm, in the book I've said, if anyone can come up with, with um, you know, an alternative uh, evidence to the fact, I'm quite happy to, because I, I want the book to be a living document. I want it to be um, accurate. So because, is your book a proposition? I mean, is your book a hypothesis then or a proposition to say this is how you believe it should be run and that actually we're not running it correctly uh, in, uh, in, the, in the fact that, you know, the Constitution, the way law is operating uh, and I've, that sort of thing? I've tried to, as I say, be, well, I, I, I am completely transparent because I'm showing all the, the source mm. material as well of where I've found the writing. So this is not just my... Um, my view of it, I'm merely joining the dots, yeah. finding the passages. So there's, there's, there's a few people that, that our, uh, our law lords use in any constitutional matters. There's the, the most go-to people are um, either Matthew, Sir Matthew Hale, but um, Sir Edward Cook, spelt C-O-K-E, right. like, like the drink Coke, but it's yeah. pronounced yeah. Cook. He was, um, he was not just a uh, barrister, a member of parliament, he also was appointed um, Lord Chief Justice under both uh, Queen Elizabeth I and James I. I've got some... Uh... So much, and, and a little bit later, there's a chap called um, Sir William Blackstone. Right. I'm just, I'm just showing a bit of coat. Yeah, just absolutely. To, so, so some of these books, you'll see they're for... So he was one of the first sort of... Um, people of you know as, as a lord chief justice and when he was even when he was very much earlier in his um career he would actually write out the different cases that he had and um and so he would the first time that he you know first record of of people logging outcomes from jury trials and things like that um but he was yeah sorry you go on and I was going to say, so um, Sir William Blackstone yes. um, didn't really come. He his was um, he's counted for for his commentaries, the four books of the laws of England, and again he um, was professor of law, came rose to prominence primarily because of of, of these these commentaries on the law, um, but the law lords go to both Sir Edward Cook and Sir William Blackstone throughout you know even to modern times they'll, they'll quote them on certain constitutional matters so i've drawn very heavily in the book um pointing to you know um the mechanisms of how to hold oppressive and tyrannical parliaments and government to account and there are three largely um and th there's the royal assent process so the, the, there's three legs to the stool, if you, as it were, to make new laws. Um, it requires the approval of both the House of Commons and the House of Lords and the monarch. So this is where the, the royal seal or the signet ring is applied and the signature signatures applied to, to give the, that bill royal assent. And then it becomes they're, law. It becomes law. Yeah. They're there because we've placed, because of the, um, their primary role as monarch and parliament is to safeguard our undoubted and inalienable rights that are, are immutable. Yes. Having so to stop a you know a rogue government or parliament from passing laws that are unjust and repugnant to the constitution and and, and infringe and subvert our inalienable rights, the the king or the queen is supposed to say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give, I'm going to reserve right. one consent. That's, of course, assuming that the king and the queen is uh, not in cahoots with the government and trying to push uh, an agenda. Yeah, or a particular ideology. Or an ideology, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, um, so then you're stuffed, aren't you? I mean, what do you do? Well, there's, 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 that's why you've got the, the three mechanisms. So 
Um, so just to give it context, because I'm, mm. I'm mm. conscious that your viewers possibly are not just linked with um, the, the British Isles. So the same process for royal assent. Um, so the last time a law was actually um, returned, um, assent reserved, was, was Queen Anne, so early 1700s. Oh, right. Really? Yeah. That's so the last there, time she a, said, no, thank you, we won't have that. And it was based on the advice from her ministers at the time that there was, there was a law around um, Scottish militia. militia. She, she was advised that there might be a bit of backlash and up, uprising not to, not to pass it. So there's been a long precedent of just laws being passed without any formal um, process of, mm. of, of that um, safety mechanism being, being invoked. Um, and it's just, it was almost, almost unthinkable that, that, that a monarch would, would question the advice of ministers and government and, and parliament not to pass a law. Yeah. Um, but it's there for, and it's been put there within our constitution for exactly this reason where we're finding laws are now being passed that are repugnant to our, to our constitution. They're unjust and they're unfair, but they're also um, promoting ideologies that are subverting our basic rights. Um, the same mechanism is used to pass laws in Canada, Australia and New Zealand. And when there, was, there were other members of our Commonwealth, it also applied in Ireland up until April of 1949, when they no longer become, were, were members of, of the Commonwealth. Um, and that, that, those duties, so there was some acts, some statutes that were passed where it would allow the Queen's cousins, as what they referred to, to um, sign royal assent on her behalf or his behalf. And um, those same mechanisms you use, they're called governor generals. So in Canada, you've also got lieutenant governors for each of the provinces. Um, and it doesn't matter what they call their upper or lower house, there's still the, the mechanism for royal assent is, is, is it really how they don't become laws in Canada or Australia or New Zealand without that royal assent. Right. And um, so that's, in theory, the, the mechanism the safety, the, the, monarch, safety, the valve. safety mechanism, the mm. safety valve to stop rogue parliament and governments running off and writing laws that are, that are not, you know, that are subverting our inalienable rights. The second element is what we mentioned earlier, which was jury uh, trial by jury. Trial by jury, because they're not just check. They're, they're, they're um, the, the twelve true, you know. The true oh, just men, as it were. Yeah, it, yeah, so they, they, they can repeal those. not only the, the person, but the rule or the law itself. Yeah, so they're, they're judging two, two things, yes. ultimately. Yes. The facts of the case. With, right. whether, so an example might be um, uh, a single mum, she's or a widow, she, you know, she's lost her husband in, in the last crusade or whatever it was. And, um, as, you there, do. There, as you do. And there was a local, local law... Um, L-O-R-E, you know, which becomes folklore and things like that. There might be a, a local law within that little hundred that says, um, well, we observe, you know, the Sabbath. We don't harvest our vegetables from our gardens on a Sunday. Um, but she'd been off all week caring for a, you know, a, a, another family member in a different village or whatever. The only way that she could feed her children was to go and harvest her vegetables on a, on a Sunday. So you'd have loads of witnesses saying, oh, yes, we all saw her collecting her vegetables on, on a Sunday and she broke the law. Mm. But the, 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 the ability to have jury independence so that, you know, that they act independently, they're not guided, the 12, those 12 jurors are not guided by you know, a judge or somebody else or um, groupthink mm. in terms of you know, all these other witnesses have said, oh, she's broken the law. Well, they're, they're there to judge, well, OK, well, yes, all right, she was guilty of of breaking the law but is that rule is that local law unjust Worth having yeah if does, it, does not... it really subvert her basic rights to feed her family in mm. which case say well this is you know when we wrote this rule we didn't really counter for that option that she might you know there might be a situation where it, it's just repugnant to the concept that you should be able to feed yourself and feed your family so they would annul that that law yeah. Um, yeah. and that principle you know in, in a very rudimentary term is still valid now. Right. So, and, and, and we don't know. I mean, most people don't think about that. So we could, no. in theory, go, do you know what? You know, actually, 
in a more modern situation that the that if you could get a jury in which you don't get in a magistrate's court for some sort of silly little bylaw that's yeah. been um, an infringement you say actually you know this is just a money-making scam isn't it you really yeah. if you look at it it's not really a benefit to anybody shall we just get rid of that law as well why not yeah okay yeah, yeah. Oh, agreement anybody say no no nope. that's what we want so that the the jury are being the judges not the judge on the bench yes yeah mm. and this is this is the the thing so that i've used in the you know i've been criticized in the past for using the word that there was a convener oh mm. this doesn't say anywhere that there's a convener well if you go back i did find and i've included it in the book you know historical reference you know even black's law which is you know most barristers bible um, from the first editions of 1881, I think it is, or somewhere, um, where it refers, and if you know the words to look for, again, it's around language, because the language has changed. If you, once you find them, you're able to unpick and find references in antiquity, and it's also included in Blackstone's commentaries. Um, and it, you know, it um, reinforces the, the concept that you, you know, that you had just somebody that would hold and facilitate that hearing yes and again yes. you know all these words that we hear about you know that we understand hearing well that was because everything was was conducted as an oral yeah you, you, you physically hear, had to you hear, would hear the evidence yeah. you would you know so these these when you actually understand some of the words you go actually that's really obvious yeah so, what was, the, you know, what was the third mechanism you said there were three so, mechanisms the the so First one, royal assent, so the yeah. monarch's power to, to repeal a law that, 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 that shouldn't be passed. The second one, laws that have been passed, jur jury, um, sorry, uh, trial, trial by, by jury. jury. The third one is Article 61 of Magna Carta. Now, Mag Magna Carta, obviously the vernacular, people know it as Magna Carta because it changed its name. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm referring to the 1215 version of our constitution. Um, there weren't articles, they weren't given numbers at the time, they were just free-flowing text. And it's only in subsequent scholars who have, have broken, the, broken them down into oh, right. oh, okay. so we can refer to them. Um, an article, I think it was originally suffix A or something like that in the original charter. Um, and that's the security and peace clause. And it essentially is for that, that very um, situation where you would have a rogue monarch. Ah, or, um, right. Oh, okay, so, 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 so if we have so a rogue the, monarch now, we could still invoke it in theory. Uh, well, I'm going <laughs> to spoiler alert. It's all. Okay. It's been 23rd of March. It will be its 22nd anniversary since it was invoked. Oh, really? Yes. Because, because if you under, if you understand the, the the hierarchical power struggle, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> put it in that in those words. Where we are the people, you then you have the monarch that's acting on our behalf. Yeah, they then, with through their royal prerogative, it's not pomp and ceremony when they go and open this open and close parliament and this whole royal assent process. These aren't, and the coronation isn't just, you know, um, for street parties and having you know balloons and flags and what have you. This is this is real. This is how we have maintained that relationship with the monarch and parliament and government. And um, so if, a, so in, in, in um, there were tw 25 barons appointed. So Article 61 lays down the, the mechanism by which the 25 barons, and if you go back far enough, baron doesn't, doesn't mean like baronet as a, or baron, baronet as a title. If you go back far enough, it, it'll actually means, um, it originates from Gaelic, bar, which means um, protector um, and so if you could think of these 25 barons as being the protectors they would they were appointed to act on behalf of the people to hold the monarch to account which they did in 1215 so we had those rebel barons that that said John you you know King John you're you're you really have overstepped the mark we're gonna um, you know force you at, at uh, sword point to um, to, to do exactly what your father and grandfather had done, you know, when when you, with the Norman um, invasion, Norman conquest, you, you're going to subject to our ancient laws, and Article sixty one prescribes a method where they can write as a petition to the monarch, 
they're given then 40 days or the monarch is given 40 days or, or what they used the term um, justicular, which was uh, the first minister in, in, you know, it was the person that was, if the king was, was overseas. Right. So the next they in were the appointed chain. next in the chain, they're, they're, they're deputizing for them. They had 40 days in which to respond to the barons, mm. the grievance for any transgression. Right. So this transgression that that sparked this in January of 2001 was um, the then Prime Minister Tony Blair was about to sign the Treaty of Nice, which was the final nail in the coffin, as it were, of handing over our sovereignty um, to a foreign body. A pre prelate is a foreign body. Right. Sorry, potentate is a foreign body. Okay. Um, which which. If you look it up in the English, Oxford the English Dictionary, that would also apply to the EU, to the World Economic Forum, or any other foreign body uh, with influence. Um, and so Tony 30th, Blair was about to sign it all over, was he? Well, that was, you know, obviously there, there was, well, I'll cover it in the book as well, mm. but um, there Effectively, were um, though, that's tre pretty treasonous, much... treasonous behaviour back in 1971 by Sir Edward Heath. Right. But um, they were claiming that. Tony Blair signing the Treaty of Nice in February of 2001 was an act of treason. Uh, and hence they were holding the monarch to account using Article 61 provisions to say, you need to rectify this. On the 39th day, they got a reply saying from the private secretary saying, it's under advice, I'm being advised by my ministers. I'm, I'm obviously um, paraphrasing it and using my own words. Yeah, um, yeah. You've got, you know, on the 39th, they, um, it's under advisement um, and basically nothing was done. So, so on the it, 40, didn't, on the, it didn't get, yeah. sorry, so I don't, on the 40, I'm, that's on right, on the, hooks, I'm on tenterhooks, I'm on tenterhooks. Sorry, I'm really sorry, I'm dragging this story out. On the 40th day, yeah. they've issued, invoked Article 61. Now, if you, the second part of Article 61 describes from a monarch's perspective, the things that you are obliged that you that you as a subject are open to. So either paraphrasing again, you either stand with the barons for the trans against the transgression, or it is assumed that you, your as in your silence is acquiescence to this transgression. You stand with the king. Right. So it's kind of a presumption. It's a presumption. Yeah, the, the, unless you physically swear allegiance to the barons or you stand, or you make a statement like I've done, in, that's what I've put mm. in the, this petition of right, is a statement to say that I'm under Article 61. I don't, I don't agree with, with these transgressions. I don't agree with what, what is being done um, by the ministers and government and parliament and you're passing laws that are subverting my basic rights. So unless um, yeah. so unless the king says something, it's presumed that it's okay. You're not gonna you're not gonna sign it. Is that well, right? this, well, yeah. So so yeah. yeah. So if you don't sign anything, or you don't yeah. don't don't. I'm just trying to make it or, clear for yeah, the audience. Absolutely, yeah. So if you don't make if you if you remain silent, yes, as yes. most people have done for the last twenty two years, yes, because yes. we weren't aware of it, yes. Um, it, it did get headlines for a very short period. Um. In the what press. happens if you remain silent? Sorry, just finishing that. Well, you're 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 you you bound to be held under their under their rules and whatever they're going to hand, hand down to you. Right. So so if the public remains silent, it's 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 a presumption that if you don't say yeah. anything, if you don't rebuke it, yeah. It's so I, I, I'll, I'll I'll just briefly read the last part of it. So it said, but all of those of the land who are unwilling to swear individually or voluntarily to the twenty-five barons to distrain and afflict us with them, we will make them swear by our order as aforesaid. So basically, we will hand down whatever we, we need to um, to make you submit to our order. And that's effectively what they're doing right, currently right. With, with the laws that they're passing. So could um, we, so to, uh, just, uh, just to, uh, I don't mean to push you on, but time is uh, sort of ticking. Yeah, of course, um, yes. With the king and the coronation that we're coming up to now, if we weren't happy with something um, that, that that went through Parliament and the king was going to give the royal assent, we could effectively say, as a body of people, just as you've described there, as happened in 2001, that we don't agree with this, we don't like it, we don't want it, and yeah. um, we are rebutting it effectively yes. 
and yeah. and so he would you know the presumption is well if you don't say anything you'll have it but basically yeah. if you do say something oh well the people have spoken yeah. and then he yeah. kind of has to can he weigh it up and go oh, well i don't care what the people want we'll have it anyway well you know this is this is the thing so article 61 and so everything that i've said over the last three years mm. is about love not revolution so i just want pre, pre preempt that before the next statement and, and uh, the article, article 61 basically says that you know the, all those that stand with the barons can can go off see seize castles lands do anything that is necessary to bear arms against the king until such point uh, saving only their their person and the queen and their children um until such point that they remedy and rectify to to our satisfaction those the, yeah. You know, so basically, the, so effectively, right. the people have the power. You know, this yes. is what you've been saying all, all right yeah. from the start. The people yeah. do have the power. So if the ministers want to do something cruel and nasty and barbaric against us, and the king is sort of going, oh, yeah, OK, whatever, and the people don't do something, then it could happen. But if the people yeah. say, actually, do you know what, uh, Mr. King? Uh, no disrespect, nice hat and everything, but yeah. we um, we really don't want this. And if you if you continue, we will... We will do whatever we need to do, pull down your castle, set fire to the flags and all of this until you give us the remedy yeah. we want, and, effectively. And, and, and obviously in 1215, that would have been the remedy. Yes, <laughs> it's quite nice. I would, have felt, I would yeah. have felt quite handy about that, smashing a few yeah. bits and furniture up and going, no, I feel quite good now, thank you very much. Do you mind signing? Yeah. And then once they've, um, once they've you know, uh, remedied the situation, then, then obviously we go back to, you know, OK, yeah, we'll we, bow and scrape. We'll go and... back. We'll go back to the position that we were before. Mm. Um, so essentially, the the, the the call to action really, and, and what I've written in the petition, is the historical references that makes it very clear that that you know uh, what our natural uh, uh, nat the natural law is above, and you know all these man-made laws are actually below our our standing, um, and those you know those absolute natural rights that we have should be upheld um that they shouldn't be passing laws that are prejudicial to those rights yeah and um, there was even a, a, a legal case nicholas versus nicholas in 1576 i always get the date wrong 1576 I think it says it here 1576 i've got the yeah. evidence here and i'm so, just going to show it on the screen so, so this this isn't the actual that bit of document isn't the actual uh, reference to the law but it's been that was a document that was presented in the in the house of lords and it's paraphrased there so the prerogative is created for the benefit of the people and cannot be exercised to their prejudice which basically means you can't pass laws commandments or issue commandments or any legislation of any form that is prejudicial to the to the people um that this should be encouraging, shouldn't it? I mean, I mean, this this should sort of give people a sense of power and 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 think. Hang on a minute, you know, yeah. we we are we we do seem to be living in a tyranny. The the ministers seem to be just making laws. We've got these fifteen minute cities and net zero and all this sort of stuff. And a lot of people are a bit upset by but, that. And they feel is. they feel that well, what can we do? And and you're saying there are these mechanisms. Yeah that we should be able to actually throw yeah. back this stuff back. So it should be, a, yeah. it's a positive but, message. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, um, so it, you know, it's not for people to be overwhelmed by, by the, the immense, you know, it's 178 pages. And, you know, the, if you so choose to, to delve down into it, there's mm. thousands and thousands of other pages and other documents that much more learned people and more knowledgeable people than me that I've just literally presenting as, as, as um, historical fact. Yeah. You know, the, the the statement is you know the, the affidavit which is a statement of plain facts uh, just reminds the king of their duties and obligations yes, and yes. hence calling out for public retractions of statements and allegiances to foreign bodies because that is and i think that's been alluded by some of your other guests like will and others and just yes. um that you couldn't you can't have somebody that's that's going to act as the monarch that's just contra to their duties and obligations under the constitution Yes. The so, contract, but, and the but, contract that they have with us. Yes. So, I mean, what I'm trying to get at here is the is the emotive side of this is that this is really good news. That yes. if people understand this, and because uh, you know, if, if you're ignorant, you don't. Then you're silent, and they'll pass whatever they damn well yeah. like. Whereas yeah. if we act, we have a, an actual 
um, you know, statutory or natural or whatever the law is, we have it in written form on a constitution in various bits of paper we've got all the declarations and everything to say yeah. it's not just myth it's not just us going oh well what way is the wind direction now today we'll be okay we'll get him in a good mood this is actual genuine 100 percent. we can go to yeah. him and say we are holding your feet to the fire it's in law our customs our pomp and ceremony the oath and all those things are have meaning deep traditional meaning it's yes. not just you know nonsense as as you sort of feel that they're kind of going oh well we've got the constitution it's on the parliament website you know we are the bosses you're the infants down yes. there you're the little toe rags we'll tell you how you're going to live but actually the reverse is true yes yeah and that's what i presented yeah. in the book yeah um and the why aren't you beaming? Why aren't you giving me a great big smile saying, you know, I've got the answer here. I'm, well, this I'm is it. So this is this this is this this is a solution. It's not the solution, but it's a mechanism to act in honour and lawfully yes. um, within the, the bounds of our constitution to actually petition the king to yes. say, look, yes. what we're being told is not correct. This is what's historically correct. We understand our rights. Yes. Um, and we're calling you out. We're calling you out on all the treaties that have been signed, um, all the, um, the, the the pandemic treaty that, that's being proposed by the WHO for um, government, the government's going to go ahead and sign. It, these are all um, breaches of, of your, their, their, you know, their minister's oaths for a start. But as the head of the, as the, head of, head of the corporation, as it were, the buck stops with them yeah. to hold yeah. government and their ministers in, in check. And unfortunately, that's not been happening for a very long time. Yeah. Um, so, people, I mean, so people have got to know this, haven't they? They have got yeah. to know this and realise there is this mechanism, there is this power. Can they, things that have been signed that have already got the royal assent, can they be questioned and brought up and say, actually, do you know what? We're not happy with this. Well, absolutely. So, in I give some examples, um, not just of laws that are that are in the draft form, the bills in the form of a bill. Um, there are rules that laws that have been passed in the last twelve to eighteen months that are deeply repugnant to our constitution and infringing on a, upon our rights of free free speech and what have you. The right to assemble, the right to to hold mm. a you know a faith. Um, and whilst obviously constitutionally we've got Chris, you know, Christian, the Church of England is is our faith, and a lot of the references um, in there. So the the petition that, that's been written is has been written to hold the the monarch to account on a spiritual level, as well as um, on a constitutional lawful level, um, and that's why you'll probably find that it's all printed. People are going wonder why it's all printed in purple. That's there's there's a there's a, a re reason for that. Um, you know, there's a, another level to to you know if we sign in blue or black ink, then you know, black means that we're dead. Uh, blue is for corporations. If we sign in purple, then that's our sovereignty. Oh right, um, I'm going to get purple ink. Yeah. I did so, have a purple um, pen up here somewhere. Yeah. So so in the instructions that so in the front of the book, it is a really unorthodox book in terms of I actually put a you know before the preface, I actually include a bit in there as how to read this book because I don't want people to be overwhelmed by, by its structure or, its, or the, the, the immensity of the knowledge that's being shared. Um, ultimately, people should, before they sign the petition. Um, I'm just going to show, because in, in the yeah. book, you, the, the way it's structured is there's lots of um, dates and various things. Yeah, and that's the to, book. to give context, really, from a current... So this chapter three is a chronology. Um, and oh, that's Article Six One that you just highlighted there. Oh, sorry. Um, there's a, that's nice. No, fine. There's um, reference. You know, there's chronology in terms of um, what's happening in uh, the four nations: England, Ireland, Scotland, and, um, and Wales. Right. And, and then what else is happening in the rest of the world and Europe? Because there's lots of context and lots of crossovers to what was going on in um, uh, other parts of. The you know uh, the other parts of the Commonwealth, um, the Declaration of Rights or the Bill of Rights of 1789, 
in uh, in the US, and the fact that there's a declaration, there's a bill of um, a declaration of rights um, for the man and the citizen that was also produced uh, the month before in 1789, August 1789, um, at the start of the French Revolution. And the text, the text, all lifted from from a lot of whatever you know, our Declaration of Rights, um, and these are just restatements. So a lot of our statutes that have been passed in, in, you know, several hundred years ago, just are restatements of much earlier, much older laws and customs. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I, I've suggested I'm suggesting that people, in order to, for people to understand the subject matter sufficient enough to actually sign the petition because there's latin in there and there's you know so the, just just to remind you you've got this petition and have we, is there a link to the petition have i got the link yeah so yeah. the so the um the petition is is included in appendix a of the book right that within 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 the book itself there's a, a link to uh, a separate pdf document which enables you to easily just fill in your name and details print it off before you you then get um witnesses to sign it uh, and, a, and a commissioner for oaths which is essentially a solicitor high street solicitor and they'll just charge you five pounds for, for their signature and all they're doing is proving that that it's you richard that's right in front of them. so this is not one of these online petitions no, as no, you no. said at the beginning you can have any number of aliases and and to do it this, this is a genuine petition this is which, and which... and signing as i said you could just submit a petition to the king in the form mm. of a letter yeah. But by doing it as an affidavit, a, a statement of fact, these points have got to be rebutted. Right. In law, they would have to rebut each of these points, which obviously I've written in a in 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 a, in a way that they they would would be impossible for them to rebut. Um. And so, I mean, so that's where the the power comes from, really, in that respect. So it's, 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 of... I'm just going to see if I can quickly uh, find right at the back. Did you say Appendix A? Whether I can. Yeah. Oh, there's Appendix oh, so C. That, so, yeah, oh yeah. So that's that's my. I've also included my own statement, my affidavit, attesting to the validity oh, okay. of the research material. Ah, right. So, so essentially, the, the the link. I'm not sure that you've got the pre-pub version there. Yeah. The um yeah. the the published version has got uh, a link right at the top of the of the appendix, appendix A, um, which takes okay, you off yeah. to download um, PDF. Um, PDFs of the covering letter and the the petition itself in a format that you can just fill it in and and uh, print it off. Here we go. So yeah, so at the back of the book, there it is, and as you say, you can fill it in. And so when when you come to have it witnessed, um, the the commissioner for oaths or the solicitor will actually just ask you, do you understand what's written here? And that's why it's important for people to at least read chapter one and two, where I explain it point by point. Why, you know, the, yeah. What, what, how, how many written. signatures? How many? How many of these do we need to get done so that people? Never done to... this before, so right. I, I have no idea. I, I um, there is a as many as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's um, obviously the more that that that, that do it, the, the greater weight that it will add. They can't ignore it. Yeah. So people um, so there's not a time limit. You could just send them out willy nilly. It's not like they all go in in one big box. No. 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 Um, you just continually the, continually yeah. petition the king and rebut it. Yeah. Um it there there is an independent church network that that've got like 10 million congregation around the country. Um they they alone are looking to get 100,000 of their parishioners to um to submit these right um and so you know I'm, it's already been downloaded in well within the first two weeks of me publishing and i without any advertising um it's been downloaded downloaded in 18 countries already um it's already been the the, the, the book itself has already been used as evidence and um in a trial against a, a corrupt judge in 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 canada wow okay this is really um, good um so we'll have the link to the book and where we, yeah. where people can access it, etc. Yeah, and, so and we'll, we'll put yeah, that in my, the which is my name. Yeah, so Edward Fitzgerald dot com, and then it's 
fairly easy to find the book. Right. Just, like, oh, okay. Is... Before we, I know that time is running out, so I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to push you along um, oh, no. a bit, but I, I just wanted to get because you sent me some little video clips of you. Mm. Uh, well, not so much you, but your you, you, well, it's your hands and things um, at Q at the at the archive, and of course yeah. we have got the oath coming up, and you've you've shown me. Let me see if I can find a little clip here of um, the coronation oath. Now let's just if you could describe because I know these are silent uh, sure. images. Yes. Um, yeah. So hang on. These, these are, so these are the seals from previous ones, are they? So that's King George the uh, Court of Claims. So what they have, um, so their great seal. That each king has and queen have their own great seal, and they they're a wax seal, wax mold. This one I'm showing. This one is because you can see there's like a braid that go, goes into the manuscript, and then it's braided, and then they fix their, a seal over it to mm. show that it's the authenticity of the document. In this one in this bunch of coronation documents. Um, the seals quite, you quite quite see, see it's been damaged, but it's been damaged to the, to the extent that it's broken in four different places. I go on but there, if, we get a you know, better view. You see it better there, yeah. So from the head, from the both, uh, and the horse's head, and then down from the stirrup, and then from um, sort of his hip going out to the left there. Um, so that would have been broken, repaired at some point. So who's to know whether that is the, the original document that was signed by George the third right oh interesting um, um, you've that, got, I, uh, yeah, thankfully on. thank you while you're finding the other one thankfully um, so that those ones are just ma maintained in the archives in boxes and, and sadly one of the one of them had just lots of these coronation notes just slammed in the box and it was a box quite clearly a box that was too small for them all and that's probably possibly why the the seals have got damaged in in previous centuries right um the oath for queen elizabeth the second was held in the safe and it's in two parts so there's a big big scroll that's probably about five or six inches um in diameter this is the second part that was that's kept separately um and this is the bit that or the the the, the document that you may have seen it was it's been shared around and there was some commentary i think will or somebody on a previous interview had said all the, the images that they'd seen made it look like the ribbon was frayed um what it is you've got vertical slits at the top and the bottom of the document and um it's actually a, uh, a ribbon that's threaded through those slits and there's corresponding ones on the big scroll so oh, the origi see. originally they would have, the, the concept would have, I guess the idea was that, that she signed it separately and then that's lifted uh, over oh, and, uh, and, and, and threaded in and, and stitched in, as it were, with, with ribbon onto this big scroll. But they've obviously decided to have the scroll separate from the, the signed piece. But it's quite evidence that, that mm -hmm. I mean, it's in, in, in Mac, you know, it's, it's as though she'd signed it yesterday. Oh, right. Oh, OK. You know, it's, it's not, you know... Um, unlike some of the other documents that I handled, um, this you, one... You've got a scroll, hang on, not that, I'll start that off again. You've got this one, yeah. So this, yeah, so this is interesting. Um, this is the Declaration of Rights. Again, these are one of the, some of the few documents that are actually kept in the safe. The original one, well, I was presented with a, a version of this, which I thought was, was, the, was presented to me as the original. Um, wasn't until I checked the back, the you know the reverse side of the scroll at about halfway down it had the number four on it so i had to go back the following day and ask to see the other one which they they would marks as the copy but as you can see in the top left there oh yeah it's got number one on it um and this is this is the declaration of rights from 1688-89 which was the um the agreement that was presented to um um, uh, the Prince of Princess of Orange, William and Mary, which then became um, King William King and, and Queen, yeah. Queen, yeah. Queen Mary. Um, and this was so. A lot of this, the preamble, is is about how the late King um, uh, King James the Second had all the things that he'd done wrong and and what have you, and, and setting setting forth um, how it should be from from now on. Um, but in here. Uh, and I think it's about three minutes 
somewhere. There's oh, might be back back a little bit. There it talks about. There we go. Uh, in the middle there, it says um, uh, that it is the right of the subjects to petition the king and all um, commitments and or commandments and uh, prosecutions for such petitioning are illegal. So essentially, it's written in. It's already included in our Magna Carta, but it's uh, represented here in the Declaration of Rights to say um, that you know if you as a as a as a subject as a, as a member of the nation you can petition the, the king without fear of retribution of any sort. Um, so there was people talk about the Bill of Rights, which is an act. So this was create. So this document was then tweaked and adjusted a little bit and then pushed through Parliament in the same year in 1689. And um, and a lot of people still refer to this. But the problem with with um, with acts of Parliament is Parliament deems itself to be sovereign and supreme in the respect that it can uh, repeal anything that, that yeah. it likes. It's a bit like um, the Magna Carta. So the 1215 version was try they tried to Subsequent queen, kings tried to water it down a little bit, the obligations upon them. And the 1225 version was then made into an act of parliament in 1297. How many of those 60, what, the 61 articles do you think actually still remain in the act? I think the it's two, version? isn't it? Is it two that's left? Three. Oh, three. 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 Yeah, you're very, very close, yeah. So, um, and yet you will have people that will say, ah, oh, but all these things, you know, they don't really apply to us anymore. And they've been removed because they don't, you know, they were relevant at the time and they're not now. Um, Article 42 of Magna Carta stipulates that you should have free movement of travel. Uh, which, that 15 which minute cities might. Uh... 15 minute cities, lockdowns from the COVID period, um, all, all, all deemed illegal under the Constitution. Um, Article 39, I mean, there's various ones that, that are so relevant. I think Article 39 is one of the ones that's been left in there in the statute version of the. So uh, there's the statute version, but there's the, the complete version. And you're saying that basically the complete version can't really be watered down, even though the, the Parliament think they see. can and promote that as being, you know, the, yeah, the situation. So this, is, this is the problem of, of the. So even the education that's given to new MPs to, to, to give them advice on constitution and all the rest of it. Is perpetuating this this narrative that that Parliament is sovereign and mm. and they have hold supreme um, powers to not be held accountable to um, things that were passed by previous parliaments. In the petition of right that, that I've written, it rebuts that, and I give evidence. Even um, Lord Hope um, and Stein, more recently in the last ten years, um, issued a ruling judgment that that supported the original premise from Sir Edward Cook, which said that, the, that our common law and our trial by jury would hold, um, will, will, will annul laws that are, that are repugnant to right, our rights. Right. Um, so it's not, you know, some of these things are not completely lost, they're just buried. I mean, even common sense would say, if you're, you know, man came first, government came second, why would... Uh, whoever says, well, we need a government, why would you go, well, actually, we'll, we'll create you and you can have complete and utter power over us? I mean, you just wouldn't yeah. do it, would you? No. You wouldn't do it. You, you're going to have some sort of checks and balances. So that the fact that the parliament can say, well, actually, sorry, boys, we are, um, we are the sovereign, so what we say goes. I mean, just common sense would say, well, that's stupid. I mean, yeah. come on, grow up. But it's it, it's it's said enough times with with conviction and authority. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People believe that, it. That, that you would believe it, and you know, I'm I wouldn't regard myself as an anarchist or anything like that. You know, I I'm just um, like yourself, and probably like most of your view, all of your viewers, and a vast majority of people in the country that that actually would say, hang on, those that just doesn't sit right with us. Mm. No, um, absolutely, and you can see how people are. Um, reacting to a government that's 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 got overreach and is yeah. trying to push people into areas, and people are saying, you know, this isn't right. This isn't right. And and you know, you're not saying we want to get completely. I mean, I have said that, but but generally, you're not saying we want to get rid of governments and all of that. We just want right. you to uh, be a proper 
government yeah. that, that respects the um, the wishes of the people yeah. and, and, so, and we'll all be happy again. I, I, there was um, a comment that I received back through, a, through, through my sister, actually, and, and when she was trying to explain the book that I'd written, and, she's, and the re- reply was, well, why would he want to do that to the king? And I'm like, actually, um, no, it's not because I have something personal against the king. I'm literally just saying, this is what your, these are your duties. Yeah. Um, th- this is what your obligations are, morally, spiritually, you know. Um, and Because it's not it's, just for us, it's for our children and the generations absolutely. going forward. You know, it's not just, yeah. oh, we'll just bow down and let it happen. Yeah, otherwise we'll be in a, a situation where um, there's absolutely zero control. You know, mm. the, the whole point of the book is to, to, to re-emphasise that, that hierarchical um, pyramid, uh, if you like, pyramid of, of, of the, uh, the, the power that we retain the power. Yeah. And yeah. We, dele- we have delegated those certain things and those rights have been entrusted to the monarch. And it's that trust that's implicitly there that, that we're now calling out or that I'm highlighting for people to, to, to recognize that's and say, right. There's been a breach of trust. We didn't realise that that was your real role, not just this one for you know um, people to come and tourists to come and see Buckingham yeah, Palace. And o- open, nice a few, open a few uh, cafes and yeah. You know, yeah. things like that. Um, Edward, we're sort of coming really to the end now, but um, a big, big thank you. So it's edward-fitzgerald.com, is that correct? That's correct, right. yeah. So I'll some. put the link in the description. People can get hold of the book. Um, and they can fill in the petition. There's no huge rush, but uh, it's you know obviously. Obviously, it would be the, the, the more people that that do it prior to the coronation, because I want as many eyes opened as possible. Yes. That's yeah. part of it is to say that they're not caught up in the pomp and ceremony. That this isn't yes. That there is that element to it, but there's a contractual element to yes. it as yes. well. There's a contract. The coronation oath is a contract, and, and Blackstone yes. Yes. spells this out. That the, that the coronation oath is a contract between the people and the monarch to hold their duties to account. And really, um, it is very simple. I mean, we've we've talked around it, and it is quite yeah. complicated when you look at historic documents and you're trying to yeah. interpret various things. But the simplicity is really there that the people are in charge, and that there are these mechanisms just to in just to keep to keep the peace peaceful, and yeah. and that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's. That's kind of it. Thank, thank you so much. No, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been a, it's been a, an interesting journey, but it's nice that you know you've done all the research. All the documents are there. People can immerse themselves in it, and yeah. and realise that actually, um, as you say, the the power is ours, and we just need to just take hold of it again. And it's as it's yeah. as simple as it, that. As I said, it, it's it's a solution. I don't have all the answers. I'm still learning myself. You know, yeah. I feel like yeah. I've only scratched the surface with this, really. Um, well, I'm sure. I'm sure that uh, on your website there'd be a contact page so people can get in touch with you and ask questions and and all of yeah. that. And no doubt you'll be inundated. So, good luck with that. Um, but thank well, you. Well, I'm, I'm trying trying to put some videos together just to to, to explain. To, yeah, no, bit. that would be really good. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. That's been really very kind of you. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. I'll be back again with some more interesting interviews. Um, let's keep the keep the pressure on. After all, this is uh, maybe our, our last chance to hold on to it so we, we yeah. can immerse ourselves in the knowledge and get the petitions out. Uh, but in the meantime, Edward, thanks again, and I'll see everybody on the next one. Till then, bye-bye. Thank you.